The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Hello and welcome to Compass, a production of Pioneer Public Television. I'm Les Heen, your host for Compass. This is a weekly discussion of public policy and important issues facing our viewing area. This week, we will look at child care shortages in rural areas and how child care providers are changing to meet some new demands. First, the story of how one daycare provider in Glenwood, Minnesota, is working to keep up with changes. For more on the Pope County Daycare Association, here is a report from Laura K. Prosser. With more kids than daycare slots in rural areas, a lot of families are finding that despite being pregnant, or even planning a pregnancy, that they can't find childcare. Charity Bold has seen the struggle firsthand as a childcare provider. Here's her take on the shortages being faced. I think because we have such a shortage right now of providers, it's, it's made it harder for parents. Typically you'd want to plan your family when it works for your family to do it and now they're really limited by finding a position for their child. I've had calls even from moms looking for care that haven't been able to go back to work because they can't find childcare after they finally decide to start a family. Um, you know, for example, another gal I, I talked with was looking at accepting a position in Pope County and because she couldn't find childcare, she couldn't make the move and accept a new position. I'd really love for families to be able to just say, oh my gosh, we're pregnant, isn't it wonderful? And not have to panic. <laughs> and for me not to have to go, oh my gosh, now what do we do? Because I'm full. <laughs> what are we going to do for your family? With shortages like these, finding a slot can be a matter of planning ahead or other times it's a game of risk. I've actually had calls from people who are not pregnant yet and still just looking for a spot to find out if they could have a kid yet. Calling to say, well, we're thinking about a baby, you know, about a year from now, what are your openings look like, you know? And I think that first call was just crazy for me. I thought, you guys aren't even pregnant yet. You don't have any baby, you know, how, how are we gonna plan that? But that's sort of where we are. I'm hoping that, that the trend will change and that more providers will become available and it'll be more of a more of a choice I think the the part I think that I struggle with the most is that parents right now don't have a choice even where to bring their child if they find an opening that's where they have to go you know there isn't a oh god there were three places that really sounded neat I'd love to get to know them better and and choose the one that feels right and and right now as a parent that kind of just makes me crazy because I think parents really should have that choice to feel comfortable where they're going. The other hard part is that sometimes when that happens, families are looking at two and three different daycares for their three children, you know, so they're dropping off at three different places or two different places and their kids don't get to be together during the day, you know. So in the last three or four years, we've probably in the state of Minnesota, I want to say we've lost close to, you know, two to three thousand providers. I have actually gotten to the point now where when families call and they've, you know, they've called maybe 15 providers and they haven't found a single opening for their child, typically now I'm talking to those parents who are calling me looking for care saying, you know, I don't have any openings, but how do you feel about starting a child care? <laughs> to see if maybe those moms who might consider not going back to their, their job and starting a new career in child care since the need is obviously here. <laughs> so, what can career changing parents expect if they decide to make such a move? You really couldn't ask for a better situation from a provider's side because there is such a need. You know, we haven't had any trouble staying full and in my nine years I don't know that I've ever had an opening that I didn't want. Um, the hard part is is that I've probably been more full than I've wanted to be simply because you just feel so bad for these parents who are really struggling to find care, you know, and, and that makes it hard. But for Charity, there are definitely some positives that make this job better than any she had before. 
simply from the standpoint of her being a parent. At some point I was, I was looking for a job change for my previous career and I knew that it's somebody I'd want to stay home with my own kids and this was the way to do it. We weren't going to be able to do it just as a stay-at-home mom. So the part that I didn't really expect was that it really makes me a better parent. And I sort of thought I would have been a great parent anyway. I was sort of totally ready for that. But, <laughs> you know, being in the childcare industry, we get the opportunity to go to trainings and hear speakers and stay on top of the, you know, new studies and things like that. And, you know, my husband would say the same thing too because he's also licensed with me um, so that he can help out when I need to be gone. And so he's gone to a lot of the trainings and heard the speakers and, you know, learned those things from articles that we've read about it. And, and he's really been impressed that, these are definitely things that I wouldn't have done just as a parent, but because we're in childcare, you learn so much more about your kids' development and about, about children, and it really makes you better parents. I guess the only message I'd really like to get out there is that it is a fantastic job. I get to be home with my kids, and I get to help other kids grow and learn and find all sorts of exciting stuff, you know, and be there for all those aha moments when they catch on to a new concept or learn a new skill. And that's pretty rewarding. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm. <laughs>
primarily the, the in-home providers? I mean, those are the ones that you're really seeing who are saying that they're, they're not going to do this anymore? Is that what you're hearing? Um, there is a small percentage of centers that, like center-based daycare in Minnesota is increasing at a very small rate. Um, but from 2005 to 2014, there was over 3,000 in-home providers that closed in Minnesota. So while we're seeing a huge closure of in-home providers, there's a really small increase in centers, but not enough to make a dent. Um, it's still a net loss of, I think, over 3,000 providers mm -hmm. in the state of Minnesota. Um, and I think a huge part of that is related to regulations and paperwork and the requirements expected of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are some of the remaining providers, are they having to adapt uh, you know, a great deal because of these changes? What sort of, what sort of adaptations are providers having to do? Um, definitely have to take a lot, they have to take twice as much training as they used to have in the past. Um, and as far as like regulations, um, I know with infant care it's becoming a lot more strict. Um, so a lot of them are actually even choosing not to provide care for them is how they're adapting because they don't want to have to do those, um, which I, I don't blame them. It mm -hmm. can be hard. And is this also part of the fact that, of course, when people are looking at how many children they can have in a daycare, mm -hmm. the number of infants is different than the number of older children, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. And in centers, the ratios are different. Um, in centers, it's four infants for every one staff member um, versus seven to one for toddlers. Um, 10 to 1 for preschoolers, 15 to 1 for school agers. Um, so not only is it more high risk to have infants, and a lot of people are veering away from having infants, um, it's extremely costly to have infants and to provide infant care. Um, there is very few ways to stay afloat if you provide infant care. And I think there was also some interest, I think, during the recession, particularly of people who might not have been in child care before, but people who got laid off and they said, well, I think I'm going to stay home with my kids, so why not get into child care? But now, as we've recovered from the recession, are we seeing some of those providers decide to move out, do you think, and, and get out of the child care business? Mm -hmm. I think so. Um, it, that'll tie into economic development, too. Um, if there was the business opportunity to move out, I think more of them would get into it. I know when you get into the cities um, where you have an abundance of child care opportunities and options, um, it's much easier for people to get back into the workforce. But when you come out to rural Minnesota, it's a never-ending cycle. If there isn't child care, you can't go to work. And if you can't have employees go to work, you can't bring your big businesses to rural Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Sure. And what about families? And when we talk about family providers, I mean, if people have their own children at home, as their children get older, then there are other things that affect them in terms of, the, in terms of their own regulations, right? Mm -hmm. Kira? Um, I think as they have older children, um, like you said, um, they're going to be in sports. They're going to be doing things more involved in the school. So these families are going to want to be involved in that. And being in family child care, sometimes you work into the evening and that just doesn't fit their schedule anymore. Um, and so they choose to um, not do that any longer so they can be with their ch watch their child. And, and then getting a job outside of their home, they can get benefits too, which is what they think about as well. Mm -hmm. um, especially when you have kids that are active, like if you're in sports and they get in an accident or hurt themselves, they have that back up, whereas in, they wouldn't. Sure, and if you couple that with increased licensure, mm -hmm. they may make a decision. Are they sometimes making decisions saying, well, I'm not going to go into this because I don't want to necessarily go through the additional licensure hoops, right? Is that a part of it? I think so. I think it makes it more difficult. Um, I know in some in-homes, um, you have to have a substitute and a lot of in-homes, if a center can't find a substitute um, teacher that's qualified and the school districts can't find qualified substitutes out here, how, how incredibly difficult is it for an in-home provider to find someone that's willing to sub in or step into their in-home daycare and provide care for those children that meets the DHS qualifications for training? Um, and if you can't find that or you don't have someone that's available or someone who doesn't have a job and could step in at a moment's notice, um, you don't meet the requirements for DHS licensing. So if we were to compare, say, child care in Minnesota now, say to 10 years ago, how have the regulations really changed? Is it a given number of hours every year? Or what are the changes? Quantify that in a way for me. Kayla, let's start um, with you. So for family child care, um, you have to have 16 hours of training now every year before it used to be eight, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so doubling that, um, taking a lot more training. And it's hard for prep providers to, to make time in the evening or to make time on weekends um, because they need family time as well. Um, so that's a big change. Um, so those are the major changes. It's, it's about the hours that they have to put in. And I know, Tricia, when we were talking before the show started here, it's also a matter of the additional paperwork, right, is that we see... You know, more record keeping, more of those kinds of things, which also after a long day of caring for children can be rather discouraging, right? There is. There's quite a bit of additional record keeping um, that goes with it. 
the licensing for centers versus in homes is very different. Centers um, are held to a different standard, and some of it's much higher and harder to follow. Um, but they're getting closer with in homes with the requirements for paperwork um, on the children. And then, as well as if you're on any type of food programs or anything to be able to sustain your in home program or your center program, that's a lot of record keeping. Mm -hmm. um, taking families that qualify for child care assistance um, through the county, that's an additional extra record keeping that they add on. Um, and it gets to be daunting sometimes, and you don't realize that when you take care of children, you'd think that that 12 hour day would be enough, but there's still plenty more to do after that. Well, and I expect too that if you're looking, if you're moving into a rural area, let's say, and you have small children, you might have a very different situation if you're moving into a regional center of 10 or 20,000 people mm -hmm. than if you're moving into a small town of, of 1,000 or 500 or 2,000 people. What is that difference like for, for people who are looking for child care? I think it's be a lot harder to find. Um, most programs that I've seen and worked with, they're full, and parents have to call. I mean, if you're going to have a new child, they're calling, you know, eight months in advance mm -hmm. to find a, a spot, and sometimes there isn't one. Um, so I think not having as many opportunities to find child care um, for them is the struggle. And from what I understand, this is also, sometimes when people say that this is a critical workforce need, people talk mm -hmm. about support for families. But in terms of workforce, is it, I think we have situations where people move into a community or they want to move into a community, but they're reluctant to take the job because they can't find child care. Mm -hmm. Are we hearing that sort of thing going on? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also impacting the business's desire to move into certain communities, too. Um, I know Montevideo has struggled specifically with their economic development, really wanting to get big businesses to come to Montevideo and develop in Montevideo. Um, and the EDA director in Montevideo was told specifically, there's not enough child care in your area for us to build there. Um, so they chose to go somewhere else. Um, if there's no child care, there's no workforce. Um, and that is a huge issue um, for economic development. Which is the sort of thing I think is an adjustment for many people because they think about so many traditional workforce issues, but this is an emerging workforce issue that's really forcing communities to take it very seriously. Mm -hmm. What do you think the next, the next changes are for child care, either in Minnesota or in other parts of the country? Where, where do we go next on, on child care and addressing these shortages? Any ideas? Kiel? I mean, as you, look at the, as you look at the field, are there things that you think that are, that are changing that, that might provide some... Um, something to help out the shortages? Um, I know we've been working, like for child care, but we've been working closely with other um, organizations to try to get funding to help subsidize like um, licensing fees and stuff to get people to maybe be interested in joining mm -hmm. um, family child care, um, but it's a struggle. It's really hard to um, get people that want to do it or even they might want to try and they give it a try and they realize I, I, don't, I can't do it. It's not, kids aren't for everybody, you know, mm -hmm. dealing with them for 12 hours can be exhausting. Um, so just getting um, just additional support as, um, out, out in the community as much as we can and um, talking to the community. We have like resource fairs, um, info sessions, just to like let the community know like what's going on and we, this is what we need. Um, and, and also, again, I suppose you, you're looking at situations where you mentioned people are in a forgiven period of time and then moving out, so it's almost as if you have to have a continual number of people going into the profession mm -hmm. in order to replace the people who are leaving. Because, as you said, it may very well be high burnout for folks. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you see a lot in, like, child care centers, like the turnover, staff turnover is high because it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's not for everybody. Sometimes you get burnt out. and. Um, at a center, I know you can probably attest to this, that um, to find qualified teachers willing to work, you know, those hours or get paid that amount is hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's hard to find. Yeah. The DHS regulations uh, for child care center staffing um, are much different than in, their regulations are different than in-home. Um, it's an average of about 30 hours a year of continuing education, which is all um, nights and weekends in addition to their 40-hour work weeks that they put in. Um, and they are held to a different standard as far as education levels for teachers, assistant teachers, and aides in a child care center. Um, and that can get very hard to find in rural Minnesota to find staff that meet the qualifications. Uh, there are no other centers in Chippewa County, um, so to find someone that already has two years of center experience to make them assistant teacher qualified is difficult. Um, so there are programs. I know Midwest in Granite Falls has a great child care program, um, and they work as feeder programs to get us some staffing too. Um, and that really helps, but I don't, um, I don't foresee... Probably not a lot of changes necessarily, because I mean, you, you, have to, you have some people going into it, maybe not necessarily enough. 
Right. Correct. There's just not enough staffing um, to meet the turnover and, and to meet the need. Um, if there was space availability to grow a program, we could do it. There's the need, but there's not necessarily the staffing or the support behind it. Yeah. So um, also regional differences. Uh, if someone is looking at child care, not only are there between large towns and small towns or, or large towns, small towns, and urban areas, but also state-to-state -state differences, right? People may find if they move from Minnesota to South Dakota or Iowa to North Dakota that they may see significant differences e either in operating a child care or in finding it, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are different regulations statewide um, for centers and for um, in-homes. It all depends on the state that you live in and your local governing agency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about as we look at some of these folks who are um, thinking about the opportunities? Uh, that there may be because of course there's clearly demand mm -hmm. we hear that there's a demand and so of course people say oh gosh there's a demand there maybe I should consider being a child care provider as a career what kind of advice would you have for folks who are considering becoming a child care provider and Kayla I'll start with you um, I would have them contact their um, licensor if you're going to be a family child care um, contact somebody in the county um, because she'll be they will be able to give you um, feedback on licensing fees, um, the training that you need to take before you get started, and, and even just how to get going, and even um, funding, too, that's out there. Um, sometimes there's grants um, to kind of get your program started, so the licensor would have the best advice. Um, if it's a center, you do have to go to the state, to DHS, um, and they'd be able to put you to the rules and regulations of getting started. When you're talking about grants, are these sort of state grants to sort of help people get started with the with the process? Um, for like, for if it's like a family child care, it's per county, so it's county grants or regional okay. grants. Um, they can kind of get like their startup going. Um, so that that's what I, I'm not sure if state. I don't know if state has anything for centers I don't at think this the point. State has centers, um, but there are programs um, like First Children's Finance mm -hmm. um, through Minnesota. I know they work maybe in a tri-state area as well. Um, that offer loans and startups specifically for child care programs in greater Minnesota. Okay, and what about for advice for families who are searching for child care? Because of course, you know, when they're moving into a new area or even if the area, you know, it can be daunting mm -hmm. for people to, to think about, well, what do I do about child care? Any advice for them? Yeah, um, we have a website called parenttour.org where they can search um, their town, their neighborhood, um, their even route to work. Could, could um, you say that again? Parent what? Parentaware.org. Parentaware.org. Okay. And they will, um, it actually pulls up any programs that are um, rated and non rated um, in that area where you're looking for. They can call them that way. Um, we also have um, Child Care Resource or Child Care um, Aware has um, a resource where you can call in and um, get um, a representative and they can she'll pull up the list for you as well. Okay. Is any advice? Patricia? Um, I would say start right away. Um, it's not something you want to wait for. If you're looking for child care, um, I would check right away. Um, we have families that call before they even find out that they're pregnant um, to find out when the next availability is. Uh, that's how far out we are. We only have 12 infant spots in Chippewa County and they're all in center-based um, and there's, there's a long wait list for that. So we have families that call right away to find out when the availability is or they call as soon as they find out they're pregnant. Um, but there's nothing worse than waiting until your baby is four weeks old and then saying you're going to call for child care because you have another two weeks off um, and not finding anywhere for your child to go. Well, and I think also, too, and talking to parents I know who have struggled with this, one of the things they've sometimes said is that they think they have child care figured out and they think mm -hmm. they're fine, but they don't have a backup plan because mm -hmm. there may be a provider who said, I can't do this anymore, or our family's moving. So isn't it also important to have some, some backup plans and other sorts of alternatives, Kale? Mm -hmm. I think it's important to have those backup plans. I mean, I would um, call multiple programs, get on their waiting list. You're usually going to be on a waiting list in a small, in a small area um, so that you have those options. Some people even look into, like, families, friends, neighbors who might be at home, um, like those FFN, LNN kind of providers as well. Yeah, and in the same way that there will be people who will sometimes say, well, I don't know what I'm going to do with, with daycare, and I don't know how it's going to work. And so I, I know people who've had relatives who've moved back home or moved to other mm -hmm. parts of the country to help get them through those times. So, I mean, people also end up looking to families a lot, don't they, as well? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. If you don't have family in the area, it makes it extremely difficult. Um, even in homes, if their children get sick or if they're sick, they have to close. Um, so having a backup plan, some child care centers um, provide drop-in services where you can drop in um, sporadically when your care is closed. Um, so getting into those and getting 
registered at, for drop-in care is a big part of it, um, making sure you have that plan B just in case. Yeah, where there's situations where the, the, the child is sick and they mm -hmm. can't bring them back to the daycare and figuring out what all mm -hmm. of those sorts of things are. So families play a huge role. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, We've only got about a minute or so left, so any, any closing bits of advice you might have for families or, uh, or, or, or daycare providers who are trying to figure out where we go next with this problem of child care shortages? Any suggestions? Trish, I'll start with you. Um, I think being a strong advocate for early care and education in Minnesota is a huge part. Um, whether you're looking for child care yourself or you've struggled with it, um, advocating for the need um, and the growth of early care and education in Minnesota is a huge piece. Um, and letting your legislators know too, legislators have formed a select group on affordable child care in Minnesota, um, and that has been a huge hurrah for child care providers to have a voice that represents them in the Minnesota legislature um, and the struggles that we face in greater Minnesota. Um, and then for people looking for care specifically, being on the ball and looking in advance and having a plan B. For people who are looking on in getting into child care, I would recommend looking at all of the state regulations, whether it's county or state, um, and fully knowing what you're getting yourself into, whether that's talking to somebody who's been in it before um, or somebody who has gotten out of it. Just knowing what you're getting yourself into will help greatly. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with what Trisha has to say about mm -hmm. um, the steps I'm taking um, for child care. Um, and there is funding too. So if you are in um, a, as a county, um, call your county, find out mm -hmm. because there is funding for you if you want to get started. So there is help. Don't get too discouraged and right. you know, mm -hmm. ask people and then you can get mm -hmm. there. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you both coming in. Uh, Kale Peterson, Trisha Herring, thank you for joining us on Compass. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for this week on Compass. Join us next week as we take a look at how culture impacts the rivers in our area and the awareness those rivers receive. Mm -hmm.